Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is pressure reducing valves. Our objective is to examine a pressure control valve known as a pressure reducing valve, commonly used to limit and maintain pressure in specific branches of a larger hydraulic system. This lecture operates under the assumption you've watched the vented and remote control pressure relief valves and sequence valves lectures, both available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet or only dimly recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. The pressure reducing valve is just one of a larger family of pressure control valves. Recall during the hydraulic schematics lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we briefly discussed this family on an introductory level. Pressure control valves look and behave astoundingly similar to one another. Pressure control valves, as the name implies, do something when pressure reaches a certain value. Pressure control valves come in five main types. Pressure relief valves, sequence valves, counterbalance valves, pressure reducing valves, and unloading valves. When first introduced to this family in mass, you'll note they're hard to differentiate from one another. This being said, if you know what characteristics to look for, they're easy to distinguish and identify. The characteristics I use to classify them are as follows. Pilot line, deactivated state, whether the valve has a check valve bypass or not, whether the drain is internal or external, and finally, location and perceived function. This might be a review of this topic, However, repeat exposure to this topic is pretty helpful. Pilot line. All pressure control valves monitor pressure using a dashed pilot port. Sometimes the pilot line is internal to the valve or can be an external remote connection. Internal pilot lines can monitor the valve's input or primary port, as in the case of a pressure relief valve and certain configurations of sequence and counterbalance valves, or the internal pilot line can monitor the valve's output or secondary port as in the case of pressure reducing valves. External or remote pilot lines can be found in the case of unloading valves and certain configurations of sequence and counterbalance valves. Deactivated state. All pressure control valves have a deactivated state. When pressure in the pilot line exceeds the adjustable set value, the valve actuates into its opposite state. Most of these valves are normally closed that open when pressure exceeds the set value and for all intents and purposes, operate just like an ordinary pressure relief valve. The exception to this characteristic being the pressure reducing valve. Pressure reducing valves are normally open and when pressure exceeds the set value, the valve closes. That's a dead giveaway. Check valve bypasses. Some of these valves have check valve bypasses. Some of them don't. The ones with check valve bypasses, like sequence, counterbalance, and pressure reducing valves, are designed to control pressure in one direction and then be bypassed in another. The ones without check valve bypasses, like pressure relief valves and unloading valves, are ordinarily employed in regions with unidirectional flow paths, rendering reverse operation a non-issue. Drain ports. Some of these valves necessitate external drains, some of them don't. The ones with external drains, like sequence and pressure reducing valves, have pressurized secondary ports. The ones with internal drains, like pressure relief, unloading, and counterbalance valves, are intended to operate with a secondary port at low pressure, rendering an external drain unnecessary. Location and perceived function. Finally, and most importantly, very often the location of a pressure control valve is a dead giveaway about the valve's true nature. Pressure relief valves are always between the pump and the tank. Unloading valves are also known to loiter around the pump. However, they're easily distinguishable from pressure relief valves since their pilot passage isn't internal to the valve, but rather a remote external connection. Sequence valves hang out around the input of actuators, as do pressure reducing valves. They're distinguishable from each other since sequence valves are normally closed and pressure reducing valves are normally open. Counterbalance valves are the opposite. They hang around the output of actuators. If location and perceived function still doesn't clue you in, Sometimes the schematic includes specific port identifiers and goes to the trouble of directly referencing the valve in a legend. Long story short, anytime one of the pressure control valve quintuplets pop up, you should be able to run through the list. Pilot line, deactivated state, check valve bypass, drain, and location and perceived function, and check off as many identifiable characteristics as possible. Sooner or later, you'll hit upon which valve you're looking at. Let's see if we can classify a pressure reducing valve. The topic of this particular lecture 
using these characteristics. Pressure reducing valves use an internal pilot line that monitors pressure on the output port. Pressure reducing valves are normally open valves that close when pressure in the pilot line exceeds the adjustable set value. If you think about it, pressure reducing valves are the exact opposite of a sequence valve. Sequence valves have a pilot line that reads pressure at the input. Pressure reducing valves have a pilot line that reads pressure at the output. Sequence valves are normally closed and they open up when pressure on the pilot line reaches the set point. Pressure reducing valves are normally open and they close when pressure on the pilot line reaches the set point. Matter of fact, you can probably save time, skip this lecture, and just watch the sequence valve lecture in reverse and get a good idea how pressure reducing valves work. Just kidding about skipping the lecture. Funny joke, huh? In all seriousness, I will jump out of the internet and throttle you if you skip this lecture. This being said, it's not that far from the truth. Pressure reducing valves are the opposite of sequence valves and vice versa. It seriously cuts out a lot of the yammering I'm about to do for the remainder of this lecture. Characteristics pressure reducing valves do have in common with sequence valves are as follows. Pressure reducing valves ordinarily include a check valve bypass because they're customarily employed in regions with bi-directional flow paths. The check valve bypass allows the pressure reducing valve to control pressure in one direction and be bypassed in another. If the pressure reducing valve does not include a check valve bypass internal to the valve enclosure, a separate external check valve must be employed to allow this functionality. Pressure reducing valves require an external drain port since their output port is pressurized. External drains are symbolized by a dotted connection to tank. External drains at low tank pressure allow any accumulated fluid that has leaked past clearances to be channeled away and continue the free movement of the internal components. External drains are customarily routed back to the reservoir above the normal fluid level to ensure free movement of the drain fluid and no back pressure develops in the drain line. Finally, pressure reducing valves are customarily found on the input of actuators and limit pressure in specific branches of a larger hydraulic system. Note the term input is relative in nature since both ports of a double acting cylinder or bidirectional hydraulic motor could rightly be considered either an input or output depending upon direction of flow. Similar to the guidance I issued in the flow control methods lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel, it is not necessarily the valve or actuator port that determines its orientation but rather the check valve bypass that does so. For example, this pressure reducing valve limits pressure in the cap end of this double acting cylinder during the act of extension. Ordinarily, the normally open pressure reducing valve allows flow to extend the cylinder. However, when pressure on the output port of the pressure reducing valve exceeds the set value, the pressure reducing valve closes and prohibits further pressure rise. When flow switches direction, the check valve bypass offers flow an unrestricted path around the pressure reducing valve and the cylinder retracts with no pressure modification. I like to think of pressure reducing valves as bouncers for a club or a concert. Given the club or concert can only handle a predetermined quantity of drunk knuckleheads, the bouncer's job is to admit up to that number and then turn away any more that may show up. If a couple drunk knuckleheads leave or leak out of the club, the bouncer opens up the front door once again and admits the required quantity until the club is again packed to capacity. Don't worry, I gave the bouncer your lab partner's picture and told him not to admit him under any circumstances. I too feel your pain about ever running into your lab partner in a public place. Outside a lab, you are authorized to pretend you don't know them or they don't exist. Pressure reducing valves can either be direct or pilot operated. The input or primary connection for a pressure reducing valve is customarily labeled P for pressure. The output or secondary port is customarily labeled R for reduced, and the external drain port connection is customarily labeled D for drain. Not all manufacturers use this identification scheme. I should mention that manufacturers may offer different types of pressure reducing valves. Most likely the ones you'll encounter are constant pressure type pressure reducing valves, which as the name implies, limit and maintain pressure at the outlet to the set value. In contrast, there also may exist constant reduction type pressure reducing valves, which regardless of input pressure, reduce it by a given amount. For example, a constant pressure type pressure reducing valve with a set value of 250 PSI will keep the pressure at 250 PSI for a range of input values. If the input is 500 PSI, 800 PSI, 
or 1000 psi, a constant pressure type pressure reducing valve would keep the outlet at 250 psi, i.e. constant for all three scenarios. In contrast, a constant reduction style pressure reducing valve with a reduction value of 250 psi will reduce the inlet pressure by 250 psi for whatever input condition. If the input is 500 psi, the output is 250 psi. If the input is 800 psi, output is 550 psi. Finally, if the input is 1000 psi, output is 750 psi i.e. output is constantly reduced by 250 psi. Unless otherwise explicitly stated, you can assume pressure reducing valves for the purposes of this lecture series are the first type, i.e. constant pressure type pressure reducing valves which limit and maintain pressure at the outlet to the set value. The classic application example of pressure reducing valves is to limit and maintain pressure in specific branches of a larger hydraulic system supplied by the same hydraulic power unit. Not every actuator in a multi-actuator hydraulic system may require the strength to crush rocks, uproot trees, and bend metal. For example, some production process might call for a cylinder to punch, press, or bend an object, and yet another actuator to gently push the part off the production line, fold a cardboard box, hold a workpiece in position without scratching it, tuck a baby bird into its nest and pat it goodnight, or otherwise exert less force. This is a perfect scenario for a pressure reducing valve. Consider this parallel hydraulic circuit controlled by a single directional control valve. Let's say the main pressure relief valve limits maximum pressure to 1000 psi. Cylinder X has no pressure control valve, however cylinder Y has a pressure reducing valve on the cap end. Let's say the pressure reducing valve is set to 250 psi. Cylinder X will be capable of generating pressure induced force using the full 1000 psi, however, cylinder Y will be capable of generating pressure induced force using only 250 psi allowed by the pressure reducing valve. Consider a hypothetical scenario in which cylinder X and cylinder Y are tasked with holding an expensive antique porcelain bathtub in position and then stuffing a cat inside it. Let's assume cylinder X and cylinder Y are identical in every way, shape, or form given this parallel relationship would theoretically actuate simultaneously. When the directional control valve is shifted to the straight through position, both cylinders simultaneously extend at low pressure until they make contact with an obstruction. The porcelain bathtub in the case of cylinder Y and a very pissed off cat in the case of cylinder X. Pressure rises. At some point, pressure rises to 250 psi, the set value of the pressure reducing valve. The pressure reducing valve closes and prevents further pressure rise. The pressure reducing valve therefore allows cylinder Y to firmly hold the porcelain tub in place, yet not run the risk of damaging it. Pressure in cylinder X, however, continues to rise until the cat yields, which, if you've ever given a cat a bath, is often associated with a degree of noise and bloodshed. Let's say dunking the cat in the tub necessitates a pressure requirement of 800 psi. In the act of moving the cat, pressure in cylinder X's cap end rises to 800 psi. However, pressure in cylinder Y's cap end is still limited to 250 psi by the pressure reducing valve. The pressure in the cap end of cylinder Y ever dropped below 250 psi due to a small quantity of leakage. The pressure reducing valve would briefly open up to maintain pressure at the 250 psi set point. If cylinder X ever bottomed out at the limits of travel, or if the cat put up enough of a fight to stall the cylinder mid-travel, pressure in cylinder X's cap end would rise to 1000 psi, the setting of the main pressure relief valve. However, pressure in cylinder Y's cap end would still be limited to 250 psi by the pressure reducing valve. The cat is clean, the tub isn't broken, and you aren't bleeding from numerous puncture wounds. Mission accomplished. When the directional control valve is shifted back to the cross-connect position, both cylinders retract. Note the check valve bypass circumvents the pressure reducing valve. Consider the slightly upgraded industrial cat washing system making use of both a pressure reducing valve and a sequence valve to not only limit and maintain pressure in a particular branch of a larger hydraulic system, but also coordinate the actuation sequence of a multi-actuator system. Again, keep in mind, the sequence valve is essentially the opposite of the pressure reducing valve and vice versa.
Let's say the sequence valve on the cap end of cylinder X has a set value of 300 psi, just above that of the pressure reducing valve at 250 psi. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can predict how this hydraulic system incorporating these two radically different types of pressure control valves functions. If you're tracking, you should have predicted the following behavior. When the directional control valve is shifted to the straight through position, only cylinder Y initially extends, since the normally closed sequence valve on cylinder X's cap end prevents flow. Cylinder Y extends at low pressure until it makes contact with a porcelain bathtub and pressure rises. At some point, pressure rises to 250 psi, the set value of the pressure reducing valve. The pressure reducing valve closes and prevents further pressure rise. The pressure reducing valve again ensures the tub is secure, yet not crushed. Both the pressure reducing valve and sequence valve are now closed. Pressure continues to rise. At some point, pressure rises to 300 psi, the set value of the sequence valve. The sequence valve opens and cylinder X extends as previously. In the act of moving the cap, pressure in cylinder X's cap end rises to 800 psi. However, pressure in cylinder Y's cap end is still limited to 250 psi by the pressure reducing valve. Again, if pressure in the cap end of cylinder Y ever dropped below 250 psi, the pressure reducing valve would briefly open up to maintain pressure at 250 psi and then reclose. If cylinder X ever bottomed out at the limits of travel, or if the cap put up enough of a fight to stall the cylinder mid-travel, pressure in cylinder X's cap end would rise to 1000 psi, the setting of the main pressure relief valve. However, pressure in cylinder Y's cap end would still be limited to 250 psi by the pressure reducing valve. When the directional control valve is shifted back to the cross-connect position, both cylinders would retract. Again, note the check valve bypasses circumvent both the pressure reducing valve and sequence valve. The inclusion of the sequence valve in this circuit therefore ensures that the tub is firmly clamped with reduced pressure prior to inserting the non-compliant cap at up to full pressure. Troubleshooters take note, the choice of set values is critical to the proper functionality of this system. Consider these six hypothetical scenarios and try to anticipate the behavior of the system. By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. One, when the pressure reducing valve is set too low, 2. When the pressure reducing valve is set too high. 3. When the sequence valve is set too low. 4. When the sequence valve is set too high. 5. When the main pressure relief valve is set too low. And finally 6. When the main pressure relief valve is set too high. If you're tracking, here's what you might expect to observe. 1. If the pressure reducing valve was set too low, the tub might be dislodged during the bath. In contrast, 2. If the pressure reducing valve was set too high, the tub might be crushed. 3. If the sequence valve was set too low, the sequence valve might open too early and extend cylinder X prior to the tub being properly secured. In contrast, if the sequence valve was set too high, let's say 1200 psi, cylinder X would not extend and the cat would probably just slink off and find some sunbeam to fall asleep in. 5. If the main pressure relief valve was set too low, let's say 200 psi, the tub would not be secure and cylinder X would not extend. Finally, six, if the main pressure relief valve was set too high, let's say an astronomical 5,000 PSI, the pressure reducing valve and sequence valve would initially function as intended. However, you'd run the risk of crushing the cat. I must point out that all these regrettable scenarios are not caused by malfunctioning valves or improperly connected components but rather fully functional valves in a properly connected system that are simply improperly set. All right, that's about it. To be sure other pressure reducing valve applications exist, but that's all we've got time for today. I hope you enjoyed that last troubleshooting brain teaser because as much as I'd like to say it's a rarity, a lot of time technicians unversed in critical thinking end up replacing perfectly functional parts that simply have the wrong settings. I must again emphasize that troubleshooting is not a skill separate from a thorough understanding of basic technical principles, but rather troubleshooting is the systematic, efficient application of basic technical principles. When your cat washing machine isn't producing clean cats, but rather perfectly flat cat-shaped bath mats, an efficient technician with an understanding of basic technical principles 
and immediately recognizes that the main pressure relief valve is set too high and doesn't waste time troubleshooting things that aren't broken. Despite the comical nature of this example system, it really can be used for real industrial purposes. The obvious example being securing a piece of material with a clamp and then bending or punching it. The pressure reducing valve ensures the clamp cylinder doesn't mar the workpiece and the sequence valve ensures the workpiece is properly clamped prior to bending or punching it at full pressure. In conclusion, this lecture introduced the pressure reducing valve and examined circuits that made use of pressure reducing valves to limit and maintain pressure in various branches of a larger hydraulic system. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.